April of 2008, right? And uh, in The Guardian. And it was the uh, annual uh, uh, chiropractic week. <laughs> and so in celebration and acknowledgement uh, of chiropractic week, you wrote an opinion piece uh, for the paper and uh, discussed many of the claims, unsupportable claims, made by uh, chiropractors, especially about treating kids, children with colic, sleeping and feeding problems, frequent ear infections, asthma, prolonged crying, all things that, uh, as you wrote, for which there is, quote, not a jot of, ev of evidence. And uh, went on to say, this organization is the respectable face of the chiropractic profession, and yet it happily promotes bogus treatments. And of course, you're talking about the fact that you also, that you, had, you could say this because you had recently written this book about uh, alternative therapies. You pointed out some of the dangers, and in fact, specific cases of people who had been injured by chiropractic, right? Uh, even saying that if spinal manipulation were a drug with such serious adverse effects as these, and so little demonstrable effect, benefit, that it would almost certainly have been taken off the market. Uh, and then what happened? Um, I, I mean, for me, it was the most harmless article I could imagine. You know, I've written about homeopathy, I've written about psychics, I've written about all sorts of things. Um, that we skeptics get up, uh, upset about. And I didn't think there was anything in there that was controversial. You know, we'd, we'd written about it in the book. We'd, uh, when I say we, I'd co-authored a book with Ed Zard Ernst, who was the first professor of complementary medicine. So I'd run that article by Ed Zard. I'd said, you know, is there anything you'd like to add if I got anything wrong? Is there anything that we, you know, make? He said, no, it's fine. Um, the Guardian sub-editor read it. He said, oh, that's fine. There's nothing, nothing wrong. The Guardian legal office would have read it. And yet, about a month later, I received a letter from the British Chiropractic Association, who were the, the, the subject of the article, um, threatening me with legal action uh, because they said I'd libeled them. And I, I, I was utterly, I, I still remember being sat on the steps near the, the front door where I just picked up the letter and just read it and read it again. I, and then I had to go back to the article to read what in the article could possibly have offended them. I'm sure there were lots of things that offended them, right. but what was wrong? What was inaccurate? Um, and I immediately rang up the Guardian um, and, um, and I said, look, you know, um, the, the, the British Chiropractic Association are suing me personally for libel. Um, what are we going to do about it? Um, and they said, not so quick with the we. <laughs> Because <laughs> they, they, what was interesting was that in libel, you can sue the author, you can sue the publisher, you can sue the distributor. Um, and they decided to sue me personally. And the Guardian, I have a lot of respect for the Guardian, a lot of time, and they fought lots of libel battles. They defended Ben Goldacre when he was sued. Um, but the Guardian's problem was, one, they weren't, being, they weren't the, the target of the action. And two, when they defended Ben successfully, it cost them a quarter of a million dollars to win the case. Right. And that's how much they lost in unrecovered costs. And, and they couldn't justify defending me um, because the, the fundamental problem with English libel law is that the odds are stacked against the claim, uh, the defendant, the author. In America, I think you very much value free speech and, and your balance is in the other direction. In Britain, anybody who's threatened with libel, the sensible, smart thing to do is to back down and apologize and walk away with as much pride as you can. And, and the Guardian, you know, didn't want to risk losing another why, But why didn't they sue the Guardian? I mean, I mean, here, it's not that it's a matter of force of law that you would, I think, that you would automatically sue the, the paper, but really, in almost any case, you would automatically sue the paper. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm reluctant to speculate about the motives of the chiropractors, but um, if, if you really are confident you're going to win, then I think you sue the person with the deepest pockets because you'll probably get the most money. Right. Um, Maybe they thought it was less likely I would defend it if I was on my own. Uh, um, this, this, uh, oh, so, so more likely to capitulate. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have no evidence of that. And, and, uh, right, right. But, 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 the, but the, it's an interesting idea. And there were other cases happening at the same time. So Ben's case, Ben had uh, written an article about Matthias Rath, a vitamin pill salesman who was promoting the sale of vitamins to treat HIV in South Africa. And Ben Goldacre rightfully 
rightfully wrote right. about that. Right. And that case was, was, was uh, problematic because it shouldn't have happened in the first place, even though he won. And then there was another case of a cardiologist called Peter Wilmshurst, and a British cardiologist, but he wrote about an American company called NMT uh, in Massachusetts. So it's an American company. He, he wrote about, or he, he actually gave an interview in America at an American conference to an American journalist for an American online magazine, but he was sued back in London for criticizing that company. Because right. again, if, if the laws are one-sided in, in England, that's where you go and sue people. Yes. And they sued him as an individual. So-called libel tourism. That's it, libel tourism. But they sued him as an individual rather than the publication that had printed the internet. Right. So, so um, you're, you're much more vulnerable in that case. And I think, and again, I know there are lots of bloggers here. Again, if somebody is gonna sue a blog, they're gonna sue the blogger. Unless, actually, there's only one reason not to sue the blogger. And that's if you want to sue the host. Because if, if, if somebody sues the host, um, they're probably just going to pull the plug on the blog. So I know lots of bloggers in Britain, and I'm sure it's the same, well, it wouldn't be the same case here, but in Britain, people like Andy Lewis, who runs a website called Quackometer, um, he was threatened with libel. He said, well, sue me. I know what I've written is correct. So they then went to his web host and said, we're going, um, to, sue. We're going to sue you unless you take this down. Now, they're getting £10 a month from him. They've got nothing to, 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 to gain out of this. They just pull the plug. So that's a situation where you would go for somebody other than the author. Right, mm. right. So the first shot over the bow is, we're going to sue you unless you retract, apologize, etc. Right? Yeah. And, and, and I, I, to I, which you re replied. Well, I, I, I didn't know many lawyers. It's not a world I move in. I, I, so, so, but I had... You move in kind of a classier social <laughs> segment. But I, actually, I suddenly realized... That was for Michael. I suddenly realized that when... When James Randi came to London, um, so it must have been before 2008, it must have been, say, 2007, um, and it was the first time we'd had a big gathering of skeptics in Britain. We, we, it was a new idea, but James Randi was coming over. It was a unique opportunity to celebrate him and to get everybody together. And then after that Saturday event in Conway Hall, um, a lot of us went out to dinner, and I had to be sat next to a lawyer. And... Um, and he was a skeptic, he'd just given a talk about the Fraudulent Mediums Act and how the law could be used to deal with psychics and so on. And so a year later, I, 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 I rang up Tam, where Richard Wiseman was, and I said, Richard, do you know who the name of the lawyer I was sat next to? Because, <laughs> um, and it turned out, he, his name is David Allen Green, and he was a media lawyer, um, but not in defamation. He said, look, the guy you need to talk to is a guy called uh, Robert Dugans. He put me in touch with Robert Dugans. Robert Dugans, um, had practiced libel law with a company called Carter Ruck, which, who are infamous in Britain because they, they, they take on a lot of these libel tourism claims and lots of other claims, and they're just notorious for reputation management by libel. And Robert Dugans had worked for them, but had left libel law because it was such a, 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 a miserable... Soul crusher. Yeah, you, you, were just, you kind of always ended up working for the wrong people. Um, <laughs> But he saw my case and said, actually, this is a chance to kind of get on the side of the angels. Um, not that I'm implying... Figuratively that, speaking. Yeah, I'm not implying that chiropractor is the devil. <laughs> I don't want to go down that road again. Um, but, and so, um, uh, and he said, he called me to his office and we sat down. I ran through the article. Um, and, you know, I think the crucial thing for me is what I'm saying is that chiropractors in Britain treat asthma, as they do here, claim to treat asthma. The professional bodies support that, and yet the evidence doesn't stack up. Right. And, and Robert said, okay, just pay the damages, apologize, and walk away. Because he says, you know, it's 50-50 it's whether you're going to win. And either way, if you win or lose, it's going to cost you a lot of time and money. Um, and I just couldn't, I was very naive. I just, I just couldn't believe that was the case. And I said, well, let, let's just stand up to them and see if they back down. And I guess they were going through the same arguments of, okay, we'll stand up to Simon and see if he'll back down. And before you know it, they've issued a writ, um, and th th at that point, there's no going back. Um, because and there's no recoverability of costs, right, in, in this? Yeah, or, no, there is recoverability uh, of costs. Yeah. But, but the, 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 the costs are the big problem here, because the, the damages in libel are often just a few thousand pounds. Right. It, it's, 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 it's the cost. It's huge. the cost of the case. The cost of an English, uh, an English libel case is typically a million dollars. Um, and that's for damages of, of just maybe five thousand um, dollars. And and the way it happens is that I say, right, um, 
I'm going to sue you for libel. Let's say I'm, I'm the claimant. Let's say you've just blogged something. And I'm going to get a lawyer. So if, if you lose, you're going to have to pay my legal costs. Right. And I'm going to get a lawyer to work on a no win, no sure, fee. Sure, of course, yes. So that's that, that means that if, if we win, standard thing, yeah. you've got to pay him double. So I've doubled the stakes by, right. by going on a no win, no fee. Right. And then I can take out insurance. And if I take out insurance, if I, if I win, you've got to pay my insurance premium as well. Wow. So the costs double and double again. Wow. And the cost of a libel case in England is, I think the number was, uh, it's a, a while ago now, I think it's about 80 times more than the average cost of a libel case in the rest of Europe. It's preposterous. Yeah, well, the, because the premise is unique. I mean, in the Western world, the, the idea that the fault is reversed, that the burden is on the, the defendant is, is, is... Yeah, burden, the, the issues of burden of proof, it, it, it's, it's cost, it's a fact of a public interest defense. In America, for example, I don't think you had a strong public interest defense because American law was based on English libel law. And English libel law was based on the fact that a, a gentleman's reputation is, is incredibly precious and nobody should dare besmirch that reputation. So the law was built to defend the gentleman. Um, and that law came here. And right. I think the problem was fixed in the 60s when civil rights activists were going down south. Um, they'd be uh, uh, maybe beaten up by, by state troopers. Um, newspapers would write about this. State troopers would sue the newspapers for libel and the newspapers would be forced to back down. And then there was a, a, a case called Sullivan versus the New York Times. I know a lot of law for a particle physicist. <laughs> most of um, and that was the point at which, I guess, your Supreme Court or somebody somewhere would have said that, that you know, on a matter of public interest, you have to give the benefit of doubt to, to the author because these are, these are uh, important issues. And corporations. In America, it's really hard for a corporation to sue for libel. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the way it should be, because libel Absolutely. is about an individual's reputation. Exactly. It is. If we're going back to the idea of a gentleman's honor. Um, you know, companies don't really have honor, they have balance sheets, and that's a different issue. Whereas in Britain, companies are treated like individuals, and so you end up with people like NMT in Boston suing Ben Goldman. Right. Well, despite the fact we have a recent higher court ruling in this country that says that uh, corporations are indistinguishable from individuals, but that's... Uh, but I think your public interest defense would, again, come to your rescue. Yes, because in that regard. If it's it a corporation... Would. Yes, then in that regard, if, yeah. yes, in that regard, it would, uh, we hope. Uh, so the first step, the next step at that point is that they get this preliminary ruling, this first ruling from Mr. Justice Eady, right? Um, yeah, so, so the first thing was we said, uh, the, the meaning of the words are, are incredibly important because right. um, the, the damage that's caused relies on the meaning of the words. Now, right. And you read out the, some, of the, some of the sentences there, and, and bogus was a, was a big word. And what that's does bogus mean? Um, now, to me, bogus meant ineffective. It's just an empty, it's, it's a, a useless therapy. Now, the original use of bogus is a counterfeiting device, a device for making counterfeit coins. Um, so it's, it, 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 there are ways of linking it, obviously, to, to fraudulent activity. So was I saying this is fraud? But to, to work that out, you've got to look at the context. And in the article, I called chiropractors fundamentalists. Now, if you're a fundamentalist, you're not a fraud. You're deeply right. honest about your beliefs. That's right. Um, I called chiropractors wacky. Now, wacky people aren't dishonest, they're just a bit eccentric. Um, so in the context of the whole article, I, I think the meaning was clear. But at that first preliminary hearing on the meaning, the judge said it was plain as a pike staff that I was calling them dishonest. And so suddenly I'm then having to defend the meaning of some words that I'd never intended. Right, so the first uh, ruling kind of tells you, gives you a signpost as to where the case is, how you're going to have to defend the case, yeah. basically, right? And uh, this, is, this is from a commentary piece by Nick Cohen. He says, at the time, because Singh used the word bogus, the judge said he had to prove that chiropractors knew that they were worthless, but, quote, dishonestly presented them to a trusting and, in some respects, perhaps vulnerable public. And Cohen goes on to say, his own commentary, the learned judge did not seem to understand that the worst thing about the deluded is that they sincerely believe every word they say. On Edie's logic, a writer who condemns as, quote, bogus, a neo-Nazi's claim that a conspiracy of Jews controls American foreign policy could be sued successfully if lawyers jumped up and said that neo-Nazis sincerely believed their conspiracy theories to be true. 
Yeah, so that, that was the problem. We, I, what had happened was that we were, we, we were really optimistic we were going to win that, that preliminary hearing. And, and David Allen Green, who I mentioned earlier, the, the lawyer I was sat next to, um, said, you know, we'll, the, the night of the, this preliminary hearing, we'll have a big celebration. Uh, there was a pub, a skeptics in the pub venue called Pendrel's Oak in Hoburn in London. He said, we'll put out a big call out and the bloggers can come along and there'll be a chance to celebrate the fact that we've kicked this into touch. And we lost. And I said to, to David, look, we should just cancel this because this is not... And you were that, already in the hole at that point for, what, 100K or something like yeah, that, get, probably? Get I, for I, that. Yeah, because I had to pay their costs as well. And, and I said, yeah, nobody's going to turn up. Nobody's, there's nothing to celebrate. It'll just be you and me around a pub table and I don't drink. So. <laughs> and, and, and David kind of said in this kind of field of dreams way, you know, you know we have the event, they will come. And, and they did. Three, 300 people crammed into a tiny cellar and there were bloggers, there were skeptics, um, there was an MP, a, a politician there, and there were comedians, Brian Cox was there. Um, you know, all sorts of people came to this event. And This was in May of 09. Yeah, right? and, and at that stage, it was a case of, well, what am I gonna, so it's a year after the article's been published, right, which is why we've racked up so, many, so much cost. It takes a year to prepare for a preliminary hearing almost. Um, and at that stage, it was a case of, well, do we just run away at this point and just, and just say we, we, we can't... And you certainly it. had friends and allies and supporters who would not have blamed you in an instant. If anything, we're actually encouraging you to, to say, let it go. You, yeah, no, the gonna... people were really fair and said, you know, this, 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 this is looking bad. And if you wanted to back down at this point, um, that would be completely understood. But um, I had a lot of support from, from... My wife's a journalist, so she completely understood what this was all about. Um, and, and the people in that room and the people beyond that room, I remember I, I got an email from James Randi saying, we've got your back. And, and, and there were people in Australia, there were skeptics in Australia that were right. In fact, I'd just been to Australia uh, on a book tour um, a few months earlier, and I'd given an interview about homeopathy. And the journalist wrote to me afterwards and said, sorry, we can't publish your interview in case the homeopaths in England sue me back in London, uh, sue, sue the Australian journalist. So an Australian journalist is scared to write about homeopathy or interview in me. In Australia. Yeah, because of being sued back in So Australians were, were worried about this, the Australian skeptics were worried about it, I was getting support from America, from Norwegian skeptics, from everywhere. And, and we decided at that point that we would, we would appeal, we'd ask for permission to appeal. Um, and, and so we did, but we were rejected. Um, we asked for permission to appeal again, we were rejected. We had a third opportunity, the last opportunity, and, and the third opportunity, our permission to appeal was accepted. And so we then went through uh, a, 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 a preparation to argue our case all over again on the meaning. Because right. we, 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 to, me, to us it was obvious, to me it was obvious that this was an accusation of recklessness, uh, an organization that should know better, but, but didn't. And this guy, this justice's interpretation, I mean, is it perverse? Is it ignorant? Does it, is it driven by a, a particular uh, eccentric but uh, deliberate agenda? I mean, this same justice had given this ruling previously about this American book on, tour, on uh, terrorism that even though the book was not published in England, it was only published in the States, there were 23 copies sold online because, of course, Amazon, you, you buy anywhere, and that was sufficient for a wealthy uh, Arab... Saudi, Saudi billionaire. Oil, yeah, Saudi millionaire, oil baron, to sue her uh, about the terrorism book. And this same justice ru ruled in, in, in against her. Justice Eady had a, has, had a, uh, he's retired now, but, but he had a reputation for being claimant friendly. Um, you know, that's just the way he struck the balance in his interpretation of the law. Um, so you're right, there, there was Rachel Ehrenfeld wrote a, wrote a book called Funding Evil, uh, published in America, an American author, sued by a Saudi billionaire in London. You have Ukrainian oligarchs suing Ukrainian newspapers in London. You have right. Icelandic banks suing Danish newspapers in London. It's, it's ridiculous. Yuri Geller sued Randy. In ah, exactly. So, it's, it's, it, so it was his interpretation and... and but, but we, went to, we went to appeal, and it was another whole year passed, and it, it looked pretty bad. Well, I, the fact we got to appeal was important. At, right. at that point, we knew that, okay, it's 50-50, it could go either way. Um, and as the date approached, the, the, the appeal judges kept switching. 
So first of all, it was kind of three senior judges. Oh, that's, that's good. Then it was um, one of the most respected judges, a chap called Sir Stephen Sedley. And then it was um, the master of the roles, kind of the second most important judge in Britain, uh, Judge Newberger. Um, and then it was the most senior judge of all, who is called, I don't know if he's called Judge Judge or Judge Law. <laughs> No, it's because one of them well, Judge gave Mr. Us, Honest, no, no, Mr. Judge, Honor, Mr. Honor, Law, Law, King, Judge Law gave whatever. us permission to appeal, and Judge, it was Judge Judge. How much more senior <laughs> can you get? Um, judge Judge. That's um, heavy, dude. Yeah, here comes the Judge Judge. Um, uh, so, he, he, uh, so he ruled, and, um, and, and we got the ruling we wanted, which said, look, this is a, a, a piece of honest comment. So if it's honest comment that's really important, then you just have to show that it's something that a reasonable person could believe. And the honest comment is that the evidence doesn't stack up in this person's Right, opinion. and it disputes the language ground that yeah, he's and, and, ruling was based on. And immediately, we knew we could defend that, because that's what we'd always intended. And right. the BCA, the British Chiropractic Association, immediately dropped the case. Um, but there were two, two important things that came. So that's, that's my happy ending. But there were two important things that came out of it. Um, one, that means something different in the States. But. <laughs> Sorry, we'll cut that in post. OK. Uh. Um, one thing was there was a greater awareness of, of, of chiropractic. You know, when I wrote the book with Ed Zahl Ernst about alternative therapies, I didn't really know what chiropractic was. I thought they were kind of physiotherapists and so on. I had no idea. Uh, so my understanding improved enormously as I wrote the book. But during the court case, you had medical journals writing about chiropractic. Um, you had you know, blog posts, newspapers, explaining the concerns that I had originally. So there was, a, and also that there was a pair of skeptics, um, and this kind of really shows the power that people have if, 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 if they get angry about these issues. Um, Alan Hennis and Maria McLachlan uh, and Simon Perry, uh, they, they were the three people really driving this. They were concerned about what was happening to me. They thought what was happening to me was unfair. They knew that these claims that were being made by, by chiropractors were nonsense. So they wrote a bit of software to scan the web to look right. for any UK website run by any chiropractor that mentioned asthma or colic. Then they had an automatic program that grabbed the postcode, grabbed the address, wrote a letter of complaint, and within one weekend, now, typically, the General Chiropractic Council, which is the regulatory body, typically they would get about 20 complaints a year. In one weekend, they received 500 complaints, and legitimate complaints. This, this wasn't kind of just causing trouble for, 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 for the sake of it. These were legitimate complaints, and it threw the industry into turmoil. Right, the, this, this got dubbed a quacklash. Yeah, that's right. But, and and, and th these were only British Chiropractic Association members. There are other professional bodies, the right. uh, uh, Universal Chiropractic Association, the Scottish Chiropractic it's not, it's not only about the claims of, uh, that they simply can't make medically, but also claims of, for example, claiming to be a, doc, a medical doctor, that's which right. there's a status issue about that, a legal status issue about that. Brit yeah, that's right. They, they, you know, if, if, if a chiropractor uses the word doctor, well, I, five years ago, I would have thought, oh, they're a medical doctor who's specialized in chiropractic, as opposed to somebody who's just, just done, done a chiropractic degree. So um, other chiropractors who weren't members of the British Chiropractic Association started taking down their websites before they too got complained about. Right, and this and, was the, some of this email, inside email was leaked because they sent out email to their members telling people, literally, take down your yeah, websites. Yeah, and they claimed they were being the victims of witch hunt. Yeah, and, and yet what was happening was that these three skeptics, Simon Perry, Mary, Marie McLachlan, and, and Alan Hennis, were, w did more to regulate the entire UK chiropractic industry in one weekend than anybody else had done in 20 years. Right. And it was an extraordinary achievement. By, according to the story in The Guardian, by March of 2010, a staggering one in four chiropractors in Britain are now under investigation for allegedly making misleading claims in advertisements, according to figures from the General Chiropractic Council. To the likely embarrassment of the BCA, those being investigated include its own officers. And, and, and also, uh, there were some chiropractors who, who contacted me uh, who, or who came to talks I gave and, and who were very supportive. And they said, look, you know, I'm a chiropractor. I know that I can maybe vaguely help some people with some back issues. And that's my limit of my ambition. And I'm glad you're helping clean. Well, here in the States, I mean, there's always been this, this sort of defense of, 
of chiropractic by those within the industry who will say, no, 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 but those are the outliers. Those are the bad guys who make all those extra claims. Our claims are narrow and focused. And my question in response to that is always, well, what does your professional association do to police those standards? And the answer is nothing. And so the fact that there's some minority that's, that's, not in, that's disinclined to make those exaggerated claims, to me, is no defense of the, of the so-called profession. No, no, absolutely. And, and, and it's, 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 a, it's a sign that shows that a profession is, is rotten deep down because within a exactly within conventional medicine you go to a medical conference and doctors will tear each other apart you go to a scientific conference exactly. and scientists will tear each other apart they'll debate and argue and wrestle with each other but you'll never get uh, a, a, a one acupuncturist criticizing another acupuncturist or a homeopath criticizing a reiki here well they poke they? each other now <laughs> But they're all, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's a conspiracy of silence. Yes, uh, that's, ex uh, that's exactly right. So, but let's back up a little bit here because uh, at this, when this meeting happens, now you, you said to me, uh, there's not that much of an organized skeptic movement, or what we laughingly refer to as an organized uh, skeptic music movement here in this country, but in the sense that we really have infrastructure of a sort in, in the skeptic movement here. We have a lot of organizations and we have local, we have something like 200 skeptical organizations of some sort in the United States, if you include meetups and skeptics in the pub and all this. And you don't have a lot of this in the UK so much, right? We, we have the, the, the local groups. So um, skeptics in the pub was really just a London venue for uh -huh. a long time. Right. Uh, met in the Florence Nightingale pub in South London and they moved around a bit. Um, and then again, I, I go back to that time that James Randi came to London in, in I th I'm thinking it was 2007. Right. And it really galvanized the community. And so you then started having skeptics in the pub in Cambridge, in Manchester, in Liverpool, in Edinburgh. And now I think we've got about 30 skeptics in the pub all over Britain. And they're, they're opening, new ones are opening up all the time. One in Greenwich just this week had its first event. Um, so those local groups are very active and, and some of them get involved in skeptical activism. Some of them uh, uh, are, are more an opportunity for speakers and so on. Right. Um, what we don't really have is, is any kind of umbrella organization, which, um, and I don't know if we'll ever have that. Um, uh, I, I, I kind of think in, in some ways, what we, what we do have, I mean, the, the, the Liverpool skeptics and the Manchester skeptics organize uh, an annual get together. This is maybe their third one. It's actually going to be next week in, uh. in Manchester. Um, and that opportunity to get everybody together in a room and to have panel sessions and debates and discussions and to share ideas is incredibly valuable. And, and so maybe QED is, is enough. Maybe the, the, that, that one meetup is enough every year right. to keep us together um, while you know, celebrating the diversity of what we But what despite that, larger, that lack of a larger infrastructure, this meeting that was called of 300 people somewhat unexpectedly that came out, the result of that is kind of what galvanized support for you. And, and I think this is a real, and we discussed this a few years ago o over lunch, I asked you point blank if you thought that the skeptic movement had been <clears throat> uh, significant in your support and in the way the case had gone. And uh, in short, the answer is yes, I'm gonna hear more about that. But you know, this, really, this is a very important example and question and answer regarding the skeptic movement itself because when we have these questions or criticisms from within even of the notion of the big bigfoot skepticism right this, these things that we specialize in that seem to some to not to matter but chiropractic is one of those subspecialties the nonsense of chiropractic is something skeptics have always been interested in just like homeopathy skeptics have always been critical of informed about you know in a way that that most uh, people and movements and organizations are not uh, medical doctors know, generally know about chiropractic because they're not they have no desire to put themselves on the front line of co of that conflict right so in your case it seems that the skeptic movement was really the front line of making the cause visible people stood up spoke up Stephen Fry Richard Dawkins people came out and eventually of course it enlarged beyond the, the borders of the skeptical movement to the scientific community and the journalistic community as they saw the potential impact the negative potential impact that this could have on science and scientific discussion and journalism and so on but really it was the skeptics at, at the front line 
yeah, who, the, who the, woke up, the, who woke people up to the battle. Yeah, there's an organi there, there is an organization in Britain called Sense About Science, and um, they campaign for, for, for um, on, on a range of scientific issue, issues in the UK. And one of the things they're doing at the moment is they're running the alltrials.net campaign, uh, which is Ben Goldacre's uh, campaign to make sure that all medical research is published in the open so that we have access to all of the data so the doctors can make the right decisions. So um, Ben, as a, as a, as a, as a kind of one-man band, would struggle to get very far, I think. He's, 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 he's superhuman achievements, but, but, but with the backing of Sense About Science, he's now got a campaign, and changes are happening on a week-by-week -week basis. If you want to sign up to it, please do. It's a global movement, alltrials.net. Um, now, what si Sense About Science did with me, um, and I, I should say I'm, I'm one of their board members, but, but they could see that this was an issue that was affecting them. They'd get libel threats. Um, scientists they knew would get libel threats. I was getting a libel threat. So Sense About Science organized an online petition. And the skeptics really spread the word. They galvanized support for the online petition. Um, you know, through tweeting and, and the blogosphere, um, you know, there are people in this room I know who, who, who wrote about this issue and, and who got more support for the petition. And, and I think we got about, let me just think, uh, it was kind of 10, 20, 20,000 20, signatures yeah. I read, that, yeah. That, that was just, you said, the scientific and skeptical and blogging community. That made other people aware who were free speech organizations. It was their natural territory, people like Index on Censorship um, or English Pen. These charities had been concerned about libel for a long time, and they saw what the scientists were doing, and we teamed up together. So we had a, a, a sense about science, um, index on censorship, English pen, backed by this grassroots skepticism, um, generated 70,000 pet uh, petition uh, signatures. And before we knew it, we had every single political party, the three main political parties, promising libel reform in, the, in that election, we had an election, it must have been 2010. And suddenly this, this issue, which people have been as worried about for a century, had, had got onto the political agenda. Right. And then when the Tory government, uh, the Tory Lib Dem coalition formed, we made sure it was in the coalition agreement. And the, the ability to, of skeptics, when they're angry, to write to MPs, to, to lobby parliament. We had events in parliament where two, 300 skeptics would turn up. I mean, there were more than skeptics. There were you know, free speech campaigners and other people as well. But that hardcore group of skeptics that would turn up in Parliament, and I remember we had the uh, Minister of Justice, Jack Straw, came into this room and his jaw dropped. Literally, I've never, and it was a, literally a double take. And he said, I've never seen so many people turn up for a parliamentary event. And, and again, he, he, he got a, a, a Ministry of Justice working group on libel reform. There was a select committee on libel reform. Um, and now we have a defamation bill, and in 10 days' time, the defamation bill goes to the House of Commons, and it should be finalized. We should have a, a defamation bill. Uh, it won't be passed in 10 days' time, but it will be finalized, right. and it will, be a, it will stop the libel tourism we which talked is about. Which is yeah. staggering, really. I, I mean, I, I think, I mean what, what happened uh, on a certain level, I think, is that I mean, I mean, what makes politicians do something? It's just, it's not usually just principle. It's also interest from other forces. And I, I think what it really happened was they came to realize, parts, elements of parliament came to realize that British libel law had become literally a source of international embarrassment. Yeah, I, I think it was 2010 um, that President Obama signed legislation. This is right, the, spe the so-called Speech Act. That's right, which, which stopped, which said, okay, if you're an American and you get sued in London, we will ignore that ruling. We will right. And this it. came out of this case of this woman who wrote the book on terrorism yeah. and, and, and got the judgment against her. And uh, we, we, there was a British politician called John Whittingdale who came to America on a tour, and, and he said, look, I'm ashamed and embarrassed to be a, a Brit. You know, we, we're proud of, of English justice and English fairness and the English sense of fair play, but I feel embarrassed and ashamed to come to America where you're passing laws to block the effectiveness of our... Exactly, and the people who care about international law and care about the international community in government, 
it is a, that's a deep and terrible, humiliating embarrassment. And then you have other countries who may have oppressive um, libel laws or free speech laws who will then use English law to back that up right. and say, well, look, the English law allows this to happen, so we're going to allow it too. Yeah, um, and the American law started in New York State, actually, originally, because I think that's where the author was from right. uh, in that book. Um, and, uh, and then subsequently, the national movement end up with this horrible forced name, the Securing and Protection of Our Enduring and Established Constitutional Heritage Act, so that they, but nevertheless, it, it was passed here, and, and Obama signed it into law, and it basically rendered British libel law ineffect, ineffectual yeah. Against and, American authors and, and journalists. And that was, you know, when, when we have skeptics then writing to the Prime Minister pointing this out, no Prime Minister is going to, you know, defend that. They, they, exactly. They're going to say, okay, we will act. And, and the battle for the last year has been to have a libel reform bill that's effective. So one of the things I think we, where we can guarantee is that academic journals will no longer have to fear libel threats. There was a, a case just recently, Nature was uh, involved in a million pound libel case. Um, I remember being written to by an American mathematician and an American librarian who were writing an academic paper on impact factors. So it, every journal has what's called an impact factor. How much of an impact does it have in the academic community? Uh, and journals can massage that impact factor to make it look better than it really is, which will mean that more libraries will stock it. So the librarian and the mathematician wrote this paper about how impact factors can be massaged and, how, uh, and, and who was involved in this and, and what the weaknesses in the system were. They wanted to publish it in, an, in a prestigious British journal, and the British journal said, we can't publish this because we'll get sued for libel. So they published it here in America. But the American journal said, well, we can't publish it either because we'll get sued in England. So the article got gutted. This is before Obama's act was signed. Um, so these were the problems, but academic journals will be protected, libel tourism will largely be blocked. Um, right. So there's some really, con that's the worst thing, no, it's not the worst thing, but from a blogger's point of view, um, if you, there's a, a law which says that you've got one year to sue, essentially. You print a newspaper, right. you've got one year to sue for that article. But because that article goes online, or because a blog's online, every time the article is downloaded, that counts as a new publication and you get another whole year to sue. Now that goes back to 1858 and the Duke of Brunswick. The Duke of Brunswick was living in France, had heard that an English magazine had said something nasty about him eight years earlier. He sent his manservant to London to pick up a copy of that magazine. Because it was collected from the publisher, that counted as a fresh publication, and he sued them for libel. So our internet law is currently based on an 1858 manservant running from Paris to London. And that's going to go as well. So um, there are some things we can be sure of. We're still arguing. We're, we're still having to defend our claim that corporations need to be restricted in the way they, they sue. Mm -hmm. And we're still arguing for a much stronger public interest defense. There will be a better public interest defense. Right, and unless anyone is left that doesn't grasp some of the further implications mm -hmm. of this. Recently, there's been this excellent book uh, published in the States about Scientology called Going Clear. Uh, and this got a lot of attention here in the States, a lot of major book reviews all over the place. Based on, it was an expanded version of an article I first read in the New Yorker. And uh, it's a devast yet another devastating piece about Scientology. We can't have enough of those. Um, and uh, however, the British publisher who had previously agreed uh, contracted to publish the book in England has declined. Yeah, there is my, they publish Trick or Treatment. It's Trans World is the publisher. And that, pub, that book is not available in England. Um, it's, th that's, that's the effect of this. There's stuff that you can read. There's an edition of South Park, which you may well have seen, but it's never been broadcast in England. Is that right? Because the, it seems to th tread a libel law that English, trans, uh, English broadcasters are scared of. So the, the stuff that we cannot see or hear or read or write about, that, that it's, it's... I mean, it's sta really, it's staggering when you, yeah. consider, when you consider the idea that in this day and age, as it were, that a, a book like this, an important book, material like this, somehow gets published in America and suppressed yeah. in the United Kingdom 
And if, 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 the, if the Speech Act hadn't been signed, it would be interesting to know how that book would be different because you know, prior to 2010, that book could have been sued in London. Now that book's safe yeah, from suing right. in London, it can say what it really wants to say. Right. Um, but it can't actually be published in England because then it will, will be yeah, sued. And the publisher's been pretty mum on their reasoning. They won't really admit that this is the problem. They, I think they said some statement about uh, they're not sure that some of the claims in the book could be sufficiently, robustly, you know, pass. Yeah, British, it's, it, but, the, the number of cases are just, there was one case of an Israeli company that had a lie detector, which was based on really ropey uh, science. Right. And the British government was going to spend two million pounds on this lie detector um, to use it uh, at immigration. To, to, to interview people as they came into the country or for people claiming benefit. So a very controversial use of a very controversial bit of equipment. And a Swedish academic, um, Francisco Lacerda, wrote an academic article about this, challenging the claims of this. He was an expert in, in, in linguistics and psychology. And the journal was threatened with libel. The article was pulled. And so the one thing that the British politicians need to read to decide whether they should be paying two million pounds for, they cannot read because the English libelers banned that publication. Right. So this is the kind of thing that was emerging. Stack. So is there a book about libel law in your No, no. No? <laughs> no, I'm writing a book about the Simpsons. Right. That's my next step. Uh, right. I have to hand it in tomorrow. Ah. Um, I'm going to go to my, my editor in New York and, and give him the final manuscript. Um, and it, I mean, it's, uh, just in case people, why, people are wondering why I'm writing about the Simpsons, um, a lot of their writers, going back to the very first series uh, 24 years ago, um, a lot of their writers are mathematicians, uh, people with PhDs in applied math and so on. And through the years, over the series, they've been dropping in little bits of math. So um, I'll be highlighting those bits of math and using that as a springboard. So hopefully that's going to be a... Nobody's going to sue me for libel, I hope. So. <laughs> Unless your math is wrong. Yeah. Uh, you know, this story is really a story of... Uh, it's, a, it's a great story for the skeptics. It's a win for the good guys, you being a good guy, the larger forces being good guys, the skeptics stepping in with something uh, with their expert, special expertise and interest and commitment to things like fringe science and bogus claims and bogus uh, really having an impact. Uh, it's something uh, that we need to... Uh, celebrate and, and realize, uh, especially in Britain, it, it, this really became a cause celeb. And uh, when you won, when, when, B, when BCA dropped the case, it was a huge, huge thing. Well, it's, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to come back here. And I know the support from the States and from Canada and, and so was, was, was very, very strong and very vocal. I said, James Randi's emailed me, we've got your back. Um, so it's really nice to be able to come back here. And now there's a story with a happy ending. I'm going to use that <laughs> phrase again. Um, and um, uh, and to, to kind of share the story with everybody here who's been so supportive over the last few years. A so, win for the good guys. Yeah. Simon Singh, one of the good guys. Thanks, Simon.